All right, hello everybody. Here we are back in, now this is week two of our survey of church history. So we covered years, the years 33 to 499 last week, which got us from the mustard seed or the primitive church through a period of persecutions to the conversion and the councils, conversion of the Roman Empire and the first four ecumenical councils. So now we're picking up in the year 500 and we're going to go through the Middle Ages this week in two days. So of course this is going to be very general. We're not going to be able to get into uh, too many specifics, but let's get started because a lot happens here in this 800 year period. So today we're looking at the years 500 through 999, so one quarter of church history all in one day, all right? Uh, now this is somewhat biased, I guess. There's a ton that happens in the, in the Middle Ages, but some of it, much of it can be grouped into general categories, so that's how we're, we're doing it here, and we're going to look a little bit more specifically at other periods in history. But uh, here we have what is known as the Dark Ages, which is actually a period of uh, the conversion of Europe and the establishment of what ends up becoming Europe as we know it, or more like Here we go. Okay, so I mentioned the fall of the Western Roman Empire at the end of last week in 476. That's usually the date that historians uh, assign to it. It's not exactly one event. It's sort of a slow decline, a series of um, major events and Roman cities falling to barbarian invaders and so on. But the last Eastern Emperor is deposed in 476. What this does is essentially create a political vacuum. There's no, um, there's no empire anymore. There's nobody specifically in charge. And so you get a bunch of barbarian tribes, Germanic tribes, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, and so on, or the Lombards, uh, all basically competing for power in this political vacuum. A lot of social and economic and otherwise other kinds of instability happen here. Okay, at the same time period, monasteries start popping up all over Europe, all right? Monasteries, like we've talked about, are these uh, kind of self-contained social units where you've got people living according to a rule of life, their day is structured on prayer, uh, and they're fairly self-sustaining, okay? So three major functions here for the monasteries during what's called the Dark Ages. Number one, they provide some social and economic stability in what's otherwise a very unstable time. Okay, so socially speaking, the monasteries were places where you could go and you could be part of a monastic family that was stable uh, and that was not necessarily as endangered as, let's say, a farming village or something like that. So you had some level of stability. You have um, libraries or scriptoria, which we'll talk more about, where ancient writings, as well as the Bible and the writings of the Church Fathers, those are all preserved and copied and recopied and so handed on. This is, of course, before the printing press. So the only way to preserve a piece of writing was to hand copy it to another piece of parchment. So the monasteries, part of the work of the monks was to preserve these writings by copying them. And they're not uh, plagiarizing them. They're not claiming that they wrote them but they're just copying them so that the writings continue to exist. And that's how we have copy, ancient copies of the Bible, of uh, the Greek philosophers and historians and Homer and all of those ancient writings basically were preserved by the monks. Uh, and then they spread Christianity throughout Europe uh, by their missionary activity. Okay, So social economic stability, preservation of uh, ancient writings and culture, and then evangelizing Europe. Those are three major things the missionary or the monasteries did. During this time period, all of Europe converts to Christianity. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about that soon, but remember that Europe was Roman, and yes, the Roman Empire uh, did become officially Christian, but uh, it didn't have much influence beyond Italy and some of uh, France, okay? The Germanic kingdoms, the barbarians, who eventually took down the Roman Empire, were definitely not Christian. Uh, we'll talk about Charlemagne a little bit. Hopefully Charlemagne's name is at least familiar, not just with Charlemagne the god, okay? But Charlemagne becomes, um, he's not really a god, by the way, he was a rapper, but anyway. Charlemagne, real Charlemagne, becomes Holy Roman Emperor, and then he starts what's called the Carolingian Renaissance, or the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, this was a renewal of education, literature, art, architect, architecture throughout Europe. 
So this begins to take Europe out of the Dark Ages towards the High Middle Ages. Uh, at the same time, in the Arabian Peninsula, the Prophet Muhammad is claiming to have his visions, and the religion of Islam arises and spreads like wildfire throughout the whole Middle East, northern Africa, and into Spain. We'll talk about that and see a map of that in a moment. But the rise of Islam was a huge threat to the Eastern Roman Empire, also called the Byzantine Empire, and Christians in the East. This sets the stage for the Crusades. Okay. So, go ahead and pause the video, answer question one on your Google form. Okay, this is a painting of the Venerable Bede. Uh, also known as St. Bede the Venerable. So ask Mrs. O'Neill about him. Okay, She may or may not talk about him. I know previous junior English teachers have in Brit Lit. Uh, but he was the, the first historian of the English people. He was a Benedictine monk and uh, also a theologian and a, a commentator on scripture and so on. Great, great uh, thinker. All right, so major events this time period. Okay, about 529. We have St. Benedict of Nursia, who builds Monte Cassino, which is a monastery on a hill uh, in Italy called Monte Cassino, and uh, this is his, his major monastery. He built other ones before this. This is the one that's still around, and then he writes the Rule of St. Benedict, which is his rule for life in the monastery. Okay, Very influential, virtually every monastery during the Middle Ages, so for the next 500 plus years after this will operate and will live according to that rule. Okay, uh, stepping back in time a little bit to 430, that through the end of the first millennium sees all of Europe convert to Christianity. So St. Patrick actually evangelized Ireland from England back in the 430s. Okay, uh, 497 then King Clovis uh, the Frankish king converts to Christianity, and 3,000 of his soldiers get baptized along with him. So France is called the church's eldest daughter. Um, 574, St. Columba anoints the king of Scotland and then begins converting the Picts. That's a, the tribe there. 597 then, St. Augustine of Canterbury baptizes 10,000 in England. There were some Christians in England during the time of the Roman Empire there, like uh, St. Patrick, all right, but this is kind of considered the beginning of England becoming a Christian island, all right. In 716, then, St. Boniface, who is actually an English monk, born and raised in England, he then goes to convert Germany. Uh, Saints Cyril and Methodius, you may or may not have heard of them. Around 863, they start to evangelize the Slavic people, so Moravia, uh, what's called the uh, the Eastern Bloc countries. It's not Poland quite yet, not Russia, uh, but the, the Balkans and, and that kind of general area. And then Duke Miezko becomes a Christian. He's a Duke in Poland around 990. He ends up converting the whole uh, nation of Poland or making it a, a Christian nation. Then finally here, St. Vladimir. You've probably heard of him, may or may not know about him. He becomes Christian as the ruler of Russia and the Ukraine. So Russia and Ukraine become Christian through Vladimir. Okay, stepping back a little bit. 612 is when Muhammad begins allegedly having these private revelations. People start following him, uh, and he becomes a religious and political figure through force and through persuasion. The Arabian Peninsula uh, starts to follow Muhammad, and then it spreads beyond that after his death. So by 750, Spain, North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and the whole Middle East, all the way to the Indus River in India, is under Muslim control. Okay, it's a very rapid spread. It's a very violent uh, beginning for that religion. Okay, we have four ecumenical councils that happen in this time period. Uh, the only one we're going to really talk a little bit about is Nicaea II, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 because that addressed the iconoclast controversy. Now, this was almost entirely a problem in Eastern Christianity. The West really didn't get involved very much. Iconoclasm 
is the belief that all icons or sacred images are idolatrous, okay? People do not venerate them. They worship the images, and that is instead of worshiping God, so it's idolatry. Now, there's a big theological debate about this in the East. There's actually a lot of violence, monks uh, being attacked for having icons, uh, government officials and other monks trying to destroy icons, old ladies kicking down ladders in order to defend their icons, and so on. All right, so there's a big controversy that gets settled at the Second Council of Nicaea, more or less, okay? All right, and then in AD 800, Charlemagne is crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope and begins to reunify Europe. Okay, pause, answer question two. All right, so this is a map showing Muslim expansion. So 612, Muhammad gets, starts getting his visions. He dies in 632, so 20 years later. This dark orange shows you by then uh, his, he and his followers basically controlled the entire Arabian Peninsula, or close to it. Within 30 years after his death, the first caliphs, uh, rulers of his kind of dynasty, uh, or his uh, religious empire, have spread all the way through this, this medium orange. So here we start getting towards India over there, up here into Turkey a little bit. Uh, North Africa. Then by 750, all of this light orange, that is all Muslim territory, as you can see all the way up through Spain, Spania. Um, it is Charles the Hammer Martel who defeated the Muslim invaders at the Battle of Tours in 732, I believe, and that stopped Muslim advance into Europe. Okay, so very rapid spread. All right, major people and saints, during this period, St. Benedict of Nursia, one of my favorites, the father of Western monasticism, because like I said, the rule of St. Benedict becomes the, the, the rule of life for almost every monastery in Europe. Uh, Gregory the Great was a pope at this point. He was a Benedictine monk. He lived in a monastery uh, in Rome, which he actually built. And then he wrote a lot of important things. Uh, he reformed the church and the mass, uh, Gregorian chant uh, is named after Gregory the Great because he brought that into the Mass, or, or I guess solidified its presence in the Mass. And then he sent Augustine of Canterbury and 40 companions to England in order to evangelize the island. All right, um, important missionaries in this period, you've got St. Patrick, Columba, Augustine of Canterbury, Boniface, Cyril, Methodius, and more. So I mentioned all of them. Muhammad, obviously not a saint, not even a Christian, but the founder of Islam, and because of how important Islam was, a very important figure in this time period. Okay, the Carolingians. So this is a dynasty. Charles the Hammer Martel, I mentioned, stopped the Muslim invasion into France. His son, Pepin the Short, then had Charlemagne. Okay, so Charlemagne becomes Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800. Starts the Carolingian or Carolingian Renaissance. So cultural revival in Europe, uh, and starts to re or unify the tribes uh, in Europe. So we start to see Europe emerge and the high Middle Ages begin to, to uh, rise. St. Bede the Venerable, I mentioned, first English historian. St. John of Damascus is the major theologian who um, fought against iconoclasm. His theological justification for venerating icons was that Jesus himself is an icon of God, of the living God. So God became visible in Jesus. So we can actually have access to invisible realities through visible realities. Okay. Again, this is sort of like a sacramental way of looking at reality, the, what's visible, what we can see and feel uh, and smell and, and all of that actually reveals invisible realities. So to venerate an icon, to honor an icon, or sacred images to venerate or honor the person it represents. Okay. All right, go ahead and stop, answer question three. And then you know the drill now. So pick one of these and uh, do a little research, do a one paragraph summary in that Google form, and then you'll be all set. All right, <clears throat> to the high middle ages tomorrow, and then we'll have a quiz on Thursday.
over these two historical time periods.